his life, and one of them is being a father, one that I would attest with all the other men in the room that's probably sort of probably meeting the mother of that child, being able to have the child is probably one of the greatest experiences in my earthly life. And one of the things that some of you may recognize, I don't know if you remember, and maybe I shared that testimony in the past about that song, but um, right after we were married and we were visiting, actually, it was actually friends of ours, the pastor who married us, we, we had dinner that night, and they had said that um, they was in a row house out of camp, and um, they said, we got to put the kids to bed, and we got up and said, we have to go up and sing to them, and I remember looking at Janet, and you go to sing to your kids, and I was kind of like, yeah, whatever, but they both sang, or she sang a lot. So I went up there, and you could hear them singing and, and doing that, and after it happened, they just said, that's kind of a cool idea. So after we had our kids, that's something besides the prayer time, we, we, we sang, and we'd sing songs, and we had, there was a, there was a lullaby I learned, which Peter and I, I, I learned in a, uh, probably, probably in middle school choir, high school choir. Uh, this was also one of the songs that we always closed with. And uh, so on Father's Day, it's my testimony to share that that's, that that's the song that uh, we always closed with. And we'd say, so what do you want to sing? And uh, the little girl boys would look up for the bed and say, what's it? Jesus, that's what they called it. And uh, we would sing that. And, uh, we have since shared it with our grandkids as well. So uh, there are things in uh, your life that uh, if you haven't started, you can always start. I'm not saying you have to sing your kids, but there are there are but there are steps that we have to take to become different. You know, maybe it actually means that some of the men in the room will. Some of you are probably maybe shame the rest of us because you write poetry, you write cards in your life. But some of us wrote cards and left them on a pillow hundred years ago. But don't do it much anymore. I guess do it, do we? <laughs> but uh, there's there's things that change. This morning, we're with movies. It's a movies and songs. It's Faith of Our Fathers is a movie that's going to be released on July 1st. And actually, un said, unlike Where Hope Grows, uh, it, it will be released, uh, actually, I think, at Nursery Road and at Snowden. And uh, believe it or not, one of, the, one of the craziest things when I planned this, obviously, Faith of Our Fathers, when I looked at my list of movies for, for the summer, this seemed appropriate for Father's Day. But what I didn't realize at first when I was, and we were out at the movies a couple of months ago, and I'm walking through looking at all the, the posters, and I'm trying to figure, okay, what kind of themes would be in that? And I'm, and I'm actually have my phone out, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm typing in my phone, and you can still see in my notepad, you'll find a list of movies in there, or in the theater, and uh, this was here, and it was advertised, was what, what really got me, it's advertised as an anniversary film, not for our wedding anniversaries, for, but for those of us who, who may know, I realize it is the 50th anniversary of the beginning of the Vietnam War. Now somebody's getting old, and it must not be me, but I guess it is. It's just hard to believe. And that was part of it, but the other part of this is, you know, that our kids today see the Vietnam War like we saw World War II in, the, in our social studies book. Some black and white photo in the back that was really old. So that's something that we're looking at. We're looking at. You know, one of the, the pitfalls of preaching on secular films and songs, and even most of my songs have been Christian songs. The, the first week I did add some lyrics from a song that was not quite so nice the lyrics. Um, um, and um, so one of the things in a secular film is I'm not telling you this is necessarily the best film for you to see. In fact, I know for a fact that some of you who may have lived through more than the anniversary of the Vietnam War, you may have actually experienced it. This is not something that you may be comfortable in going to see, and I wouldn't recommend it. Or maybe you or someone in your family has recently been through war, and they are back and not whole. Or maybe they didn't come home at all. So therefore, this may not be the opportunity to go. Then there's the other side of this, which really is a problem. And some of you are going to get ready to stand up and walk out with the pastor. I, and, and I know it's not the first time you're looking at me going, yeah, we do that a lot. But, it, you know. but in fairness, is, you know, war films aren't really compatible with the Christian lifestyle. Sorry. 
as, as, as much as I understand justifiable anger and things of that kind of sort, us celebrating war in the church seems contradictory. It can be a problem. Because there are things like there shall be no other God before me, and that includes our children, and our spouse, and our car, and our money, and our patriotism. And oil. But sometimes our patriotism and our Christianity get extremely blurred. And I would classify myself as one of both. But which takes the priority? So we have to be careful what I'm preaching on, these things that I'm talking about. about, about there. So we have that in mind, and then anyone who's living through any PTSD relationship in, or activity in their lives, this film, could, it could be a challenge. All right? So that aside, that's, that's, that's my little warning to it. <clears throat> That there are several major themes in this film, though they're well worth going to. They really are. There's preaching. There's sharing your faith, literally, on the lines. There's messages of trust and truth, of life and death, brotherly love. But today, out of all of those, I chose the theme of integrity. That was also one of the major themes. And what Michael read to you in his translation was just exactly right. We don't hear from Proverbs, right? But if you go to the New Living, there are two word changes. And I'm going to start in verse 7. Verse seven he says, he grants a treasure of common sense to the honest. Now, in 2015, that's scary right from the start. Because I'm not sure there's any common sense around and then he follows up, he says, he is a shield to those who walk with integrity. And then in verse 21, it closed with, for only the godly will live in the land, and those with integrity will remain in it. So, as men of God, and this is not just a men's day opportunity, because integrity isn't just something for men. Men and women and children need integrity. Do you know, in one of the other, um, and I didn't list the statistics for this one, but one of the surveys that the movie did in prepping for the sermon series that has to go with it is it asked Americans a survey online. It's a long survey, a lot of it. Do you know that 70% of Americans do not see lying as a problem? Now, I'm talking about lying about the surprise birthday party. That generally, sometimes you just have to lie to do the good thing. So, some of the message. In, 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 in order to get the real message out, the, as many of us, we, we grew up in school, the end justifies the means. We've become that society that we all talked about that was the antithesis of America. But we've become that. Oh, but 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 it's good. According to who? According to me, according to my group, according to my people. It's good. So therefore, my good justifies my ends. And that was some of the problem. 70% of America. It's fine. Well. As men of God, who have a relationship with Jesus, integrity should be our goal. As people of God, it should be our goal. It is no difference. Our children probably need integrity as much as anyone and standing up for the right thing. Instead, maybe their experience is, but if I have a better end, then it's okay. Said, 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 how many watch Survivor or one of the other reality shows or other challenges like that? Any, anybody? Got a couple? Yeah, I said, I watch them. It, it's, 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 not, it's, it's not a shameful thing unless we're, we're using it to teach a lesson. The trouble is, do you ever say, I think Survivor's now been on the air for 10 years? 
So if you were seven years old when that started, you're now 17. Do you, do you, do you, do you know what your most prominent example in life is? If there's a million dollars at the end, make as many friends as you can, stab them in the back, and when you get to the end, you get rewarded. Oh, Ricky, it's just a TV show. Come on, stop that. When I was seven to 17, mom and dad watched us every night. We sat as a family. It wasn't terribly awful as far as bad stuff, except no one ever said that this was a TV show. No one ever said that what they're doing may get them a million dollars, but good men and women don't treat other people that way. We didn't use a teachable moment. And they think that's integrity. After all, it was a million dollars at the end. It was a game. We don't think, because we may not see life as a game, but they've been taught life's a game. And we've allowed it to be taught. How does integrity come about? So in fact, God places such a high priority on integrity, as well as a high payoff. Because it said, who gets to remain in the land? Those with integrity. That's it. Everybody else is gone. That's who gets to remain in the land. So how do we become a person of integrity? Step one, examine your heart. That's the first one, examine your, 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 your heart. If we're going to be totally honest with others, then we first have to be totally honest with ourselves. And we don't like to do that. Because this requires honesty. And we already said we know how Americans feel about lying. We said we don't think it's fine. You know Socrates, which is a little before our time, wrote, the unexamined life is not worth living for a human being. The unexamined life. And some of the young folks are going, man, but it's just, you know, there's just so much going on in my life. I'm so busy, and yet most of us as older adults are the same. We're so busy, I don't have time to do all that philosophical crap, right? I don't have time to look at all my, you know, I got bills to pay, I got things to pay, I, got, I just, you know, I got to go to work, and I, you know, I'm working 18 hours a day, it's a day, you know, hey, I don't have time to look at that. And Satan goes, yeah, that's cool. I think that's really good that you don't have time to look at that. Because even Socrates, who wasn't a believer, said the human life wasn't worth living unless you looked inside and figured out what the heck was going on. So put your life under an x-ray. For those of you who are readers, you're probably, probably some James Patterson fans in the room. I don't know if anybody read James Patterson. Said, uh, said uh, James, a friend of mine, uh, he had a whole shelf up, and I think he read every James Patterson book that there was. It's in his house. Uh, uh, he and Peter Kim wrote, they, they wrote a book called The Day America Told the Truth. You read that? Anybody? It says this. He posed the question, what are you willing to do for $10 million? Now, I had a friend of mine say, 10 million bucks. He said people would say anything because that's just a crazy amount. He said maybe a million or said, you know, 500,000. You might have gotten more realistic in hand to hand. The question was this. For 10 million bucks, do you know that 25% of respondents said they would abandon their family? Here. We'll see it. 25% would abandon their family, their family, and 3% of that group would put their children up for adoption. Now, $10 million is a lot of money. Now, Alex Rodriguez makes it, and what's a lot. 25% would abandon their church. I understand that there was a second survey done by this group at Jessup and Elkridge. And 90% of those folks that abandoned their church just to get rid of their pastor. <laughs> That's what I heard. I, I, I don't know. Sorry for that. Yeah. 23% <laughs> of you would become prostitutes for a week or more. For $10 million. I hope I'm getting 10% of them. <laughs> Give up their American citizenship. 16% would leave their spouses. Now that really surprised me. Because I figured it'd be like 160%. <laughs> Considering that 52% of the country is divorced already. A friend of mine says 16%. He said, my gosh, that, that means of those who haven't gotten divorced yet, they figure, well, I wasn't going to, but for 10 million, I might as well I'll join everybody else. 10% would withhold testimony. 
They'd withhold testimony in a court of law, Mr. Officer, and they would let a murderer walk free. Someone should write a grandmother a ticket, I know that. <laughs> it is. By the way, was that before or after when he came in? That's right. <laughs> 7% of you, 7% of you would actually kill a stranger. Oh, $10 million. 7%. Wow. So when we go, oh, not me, a prophet named Jeremiah wrote chapter 17 and verse, in ver in verse 9. He said, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So let's get personal. Ken, it's a good thing you weren't blessed like this. It's really what written in you, buddy. Not in blood, but, it, but, but, it, but it's working. For those of you who say, I would never lie or cheat on my integrity. Have you ever been alongside of the road, pulled your car to a stop, and someone walked up to you and said, do you know why I pulled you over today? And you immediately you looked up and said, yeah, I was going 22 miles an hour above the speed limit because I just didn't give a rat's rear about the speed sign. I'm guessing you didn't say that. I'm guessing you look, you cry. <laughs> Jenny does better than that. You don't want to know. You don't want to know. You just cry. You don't want to know. Oh, my God, I'm sorry. Yeah. You know, or you sit there going, no, sir, do I, do I have a tail light out? Ma'am, it's noon. I have no idea if you have a tail light out or not. So there's an example. Your first step is to be people of integrity, is take an honest inventory of ourselves and examine our hearts. Now we make light of a little bit of that, but so much of that of that's true. Imagine your life was a barrel of water. All right, let's say it's 50 gallons of water, and in that, all the water was your integrity. And compromise was a hole in your barrel. So you made a compromise, you made a hole in your barrel, or because maybe you were dishonest at work, maybe you didn't keep your word at home, or, or, or maybe some of those numbers on that 1040 form weren't quite where they were supposed to be and were skewed a little bit in your favor outside. Philosophically, your level of compromise equals your level of integrity. It's, it's, it's mathematical. You can't put a little bit of food coloring in a glass of water. It doesn't matter what you put in there, it's going to change. Any level of compromise, it, 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 it removes all and any level of integrity. So take that honest inventory too. Evaluate the cost and benefits. Our society has a very tough time looking at the cost and benefits beyond today. It's what Survivor's about. It's what these shows are about. It's about today. It's not up the, it's not up the road. You're not going to get out without a sports reference today. Not going to happen. happen, happen. And believe it or not, I'm going to talk about the Yankees, which is really bizarre. Yeah. But there's an example of a young man who had to spend a year out of baseball who just became <coughs> only the second Yankee, one of the most famous teams ever, to hit 3,000 hits, and he did it by hitting a home run. Alex Rodriguez, since his return from suspension for using steroids, has been the model individual. He has been contrite, he has been apologetic, and he's been going about his job with intensity. And yet, all of that done, he can't walk into a stadium and walk the home plate without hearing cheers of cheater, cheater, All to have a little bit of glory now, never looking down the road. Even if he, even when he gets there, if he gets in the Hall of Fame, there'll be somebody at Cooperstown standing out there yelling, cheater. I will tell you, to get 3,000 hits, steroids didn't do that except speed the ball up a little bit. Now, the home runs, the doubles and triples, oh yeah. But, fit, but physiologically, you got to be able to hit. But it didn't matter. He couldn't see past today. He could not see past it. For those of us who are old enough, in 1971, when we used to change our own oil and all in the car, 
it was, it, it Fram said, pay me now or pay me later. So they were the ones who came up with that on the oil filter ad. Pay me now or pay me later. Pay me later. It's one of the things my dad told me about changing oil, make the life of the car go. And that was it. So there we are. The story of this whole thing, looking beyond. Anybody remember Ben Johnson from the Olympics? 1988 Olympics, 9.79 and 100 meter world record, gold medals all over the place. Oh yeah, until years later they found out that he was on drugs and steroids as well. He lost the world record, he lost the gold medals, he lost all the money that it was given in the sponsorship, and he wasn't even able to coach. Because who wants to be coach and name that, oh, your coach is the steroid king, the chief. Paul wrote it this way in Galatians. He said, don't be misled. Remember that you can't ignore God and get away with it. You will always reap what you sow. Bert once said that the measure of a real man's character is what he would do if he would never be found out. Or sometimes we say a man's character, a person's character, their, 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 their character is what they do when no one's looking. The Bible says that nothing remains hidden. Everything will be brought to light. In step three, you want integrity, then experience God. You know, it's just like sharing love. Until you know the love of God, it's impossible to show true, 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 true love to anybody else. You may think that you're showing love, but until you know God's love, then how can you translate that into love for somebody else? Until you know God's integrity, how can you do that? Until you go to know God's forgiveness, how can you give the forgiveness? I mean, after all, if we want to profess that we believe in something and we're not pursuing it, oh, but you don't understand, right? You just got it. You know, you just have to lie in today's society a little bit. You just have to compromise a little bit. It's just, it's just the way it is. We want politicians who can compromise. Eighty percent of America wants, po wants wants politicians who can compromise. I'll be honest. Said I want. Said I want them to be men and women of good character and making quality decisions. Push comes to shove, there are situations, there are situations where everybody has to compromise. But we're saying we want people to compromise first. So there is no right or wrong. We're saying, be careful what, on, on, on what we say. When we pursue God, he will help us plug our holes. The message for us is to obey and not just to listen. The last part, fourth, is you have to exercise integrity. You actually have to do it. It said that Michelangelo was finishing the frescoes on the, on the Sistine Chapel, the, uh, the uh, chapel. And someone there says, why are you taking so much pain with those little details? It's so far away, nobody can tell whether you made a mistake or not. You know what Michelangelo said? He said, I can't. I'll know. I want you to listen with integrity as you queue up in just a second. It's only a minute and a half, and we're going to get out of here. But the movie is from Vietnam. And what you're going to see is a son reading a letter from uh, his father that was written in Vietnam. It's an adult son now. And the father didn't know. The father died not long after he wrote this, this letter. But this is an example of integrity and what really matters. Dear John Paul, I may seem far away from you, but I think about you every day. I wanted to tell you not to be afraid of life's journey. You will have both good times and bad, but Know that God is there through them all. He loves you more than I ever could, John Paul, and I love you with all my heart. I'm already so proud of you. I'm proud that God gave you to me and your mom. And know that you've got my biggest blessing to be who God intends you to be. 
matter what, son, know that I love you and that Jesus loves you. You can trust him with your heart, John Paul, just as I have. I can't wait to see you again. Until then, Where do you begin today to change your life? And then as a disciple of Christ, begin to transform the world. Not just to say, well, that's just the way life is. But to transform it and change it. To be the people who stand up and say, in the midst of violence, there won't be any more violence. In the midst of being cheated, there'll be no more cheating. For those who want to say there is no God and God doesn't matter, to stand up and say, yes, he does. And this is what he's done in my life. And I'm going to pass it on to every generation. Today, that changes with your integrity. Male, female, young or old. Amen. Let's join us singing our next song as you're able to stand. Keep down my vision. Oh, what does the word require? I'm sorry. Come on, church. Keep down my vision.